Chapter six, The Demoness, May 1905, begins on page 123. In those days, Polk Street was, the pro was for the poorer demons. There were lots of common little shops like grocery stores or poultry markets and wooden tenement houses, some four stories high into which the poor demons crowded. In the morning, you would see the demons in undershirts and coats swinging lunch baskets as they walked to the factories and the demonesses hurrying to be on time in the rich manor mansions one block to the west, where they worked as laundresses or housekeepers or housemaids. There would be young demons who were clerks in offices tugging at their stiff celluloid collars as they ran to catch the cable cars and shop girls in their long dresses walking in groups, talking in excited voices. All day, the streets would be filled with noise, the sound of the hooves of the great gray horses as they clopped up and down the cobblestones and the merry ringing of the cable cars on the streets that crossed Polk. The demonesses might be back later in the day, pushing baby carriages or walking with their employer's wives, doing the day's shopping. And in the later afternoon, everyone would come home looking tired, hardly noticing the demons who lit the gas lamps. I had been through streets like Polk Street before, when we had picked up laundry, but we had only been passing through then. Now we were here to stay. The tenement houses had the same odd flat faces and the same drab colors, making them look all the same, as if they had been hatched in the same brood. Their doorways gaped like mouths and their windows gleamed like eyes, so that each one of them looked like the stark, empty face of a multi-eyed demon. We finally stopped in front of a neat little Victorian house with an odd shape. It seemed to have a little more character than the tenement houses. I found out later that it had eight sides instead of being built in the shape of a square. The demon who had built the house had wanted it that way. Actually, it made that house seem all the more scary because behind its iron fence, it looked like some strange beast that had, been, that had to be kept special especially separate and fenced off from the others. It squatted there like some toad made of glass and wood and shingles. In one corner was a turret with a big bay window looking out on a small garden surrounded by the fence. Here we are, father said. He picked me up and swung me down onto the sidewalk. You watch our things, he added. I watched uncomfortably as he and Handclap each grabbed a box of our belongings and walked into the alley between the iron fence of the house and the tenement next door. When they disappeared from sight, I wasn't sure what to do. On the one hand, I was supposed to watch our boxes, but on the other hand, I didn't want to be alone. I walked cautiously toward the mouth of the alley, but I couldn't see father. It seemed to me at the time that there might be any number of demons waiting in their houses, waiting patiently for me to turn my back so they could leap upon me and take over my body or torture me or do the hundred and one things that demons can do to people. I looked up at that moment and saw a pink demonic face staring down at me from the glass eye of the turret. When it saw me looking, it vanished. I ran back to the wagon. I stayed there all the time clinging to the familiar shape of the company's wagon while father and handclap unloaded our things. It did not take long since we did not have very much. Handclap sat on the seat of the wagon for a moment, the reins in his hands, but reluctant to tell Red Rabbit to go. We were just as reluctant. We stood on the sidewalk beside the wagon. My hand held on to the side. For want of something to do, Handclap scratched his neck and looked around. Then he began to sniff the air. There's money to be made here by a man with the know-how, he said. I can just smell the gold coins piled in all these houses and I can just see all these poor demons sitting on top of their heaps of gold, crying because their clock's busted and they don't know how to fix it. They'll be mobbing in your place day and night to fix things once they know you're here. Father laughed. <laughs> Careful or some jealous demon will wish us bad luck. Handclap sat back in the seat. With that charm I gave you? Listen, if some dumb demon is too ignorant to recognize its power and comes a-knocking at your door, why, you tell me and I'll tell the enlighteners and they'll come flying across the ocean and gobble the demons up from the top of his hair down to his big, ugly feet. You do that, Father slapped Handclap's leg. Now you'd better, be, you'd better be going. Red Rabbit looks hungry. He's always hungry, Handclap said. Remember, though, I said, he likes a carrot in the morning. I'll remember. Handclap nodded a goodbye to Father and winked at me. 
Then he took the reins, but Red Rabbit wouldn't leave. He looked around at father as if telling him to get back on the wagon. Go on, you fat, overgrown, sassy rabbit, Handclap ordered as he shook the reins. But Red Rabbit stubbornly stayed put. Get out of here before I skin you and make a jacket out of your hide, father said. With his hat, he whacked Red Rabbit's rump real good. With a snort of hurt pride, Red Rabbit started in his harness. But then he stayed put. Go on, father said, and he whacked Red Rabbit even harder. With a sad twist of his head, Red Rabbit turned away from father and began to clop along in his slow, methodical pace. From the way he went, you might have thought he was pulling a ton of metal instead of an empty wagon. Together, we watched them roll down the cobblestone street and turn the corner. Come along. Father put his hand on my shoulder and steered me around to face the alley. We walked past the iron fence and the garden to a big backyard that was filled with trees and grass. A stable stood in one corner of the yard. Father swung the door open. It creaked on its hinges and I could smell the disinfectant father had used to clean out the stable that morning. In one corner of the room was a pot-bellied stove with a pipe leading up to the ceiling. Our mats and blankets were laid in one corner. Boards had been propped against one wall for the day when father would build shelves. Until that time, our stuff would stay in our boxes. I wandered around the room and touched everything to reassure myself that it was real and not some demonic illusion. Father waited patiently in the doorway with his arms folded. When I went back to him, I noticed that it was all right. He grinned. The first thing he did was to put up a shelf. Then he set Monkey and the Buddha to be on it. He placed the cup of soil before them and stuck some incense sticks into the soil and lit them so that the monkey and the Buddha-to-be would be comfortable in the pleasant smoke. Finally, Father nodded his head to the direction of the house. Now we have to meet our landlady. Her name is Miss Whitlaw. Miss Whitlaw. I practiced the syllables several times until Father sighed. That will have to do for now. Then he spat into his hand and smoothed back my hair. He frowned. How did you ever manage to get so dirty? I washed my face this morning like you told me. Not very well, he said. He picked up an empty pail and went outside. I watched from the doorway as he worked the pump handle and the water splashed in the pail. He came back inside and got some clean hand towels. He threw me one. Now wash, he said. You'd think, I grumbled, that we were visiting the Empress herself. Father wet his towel in the pail and began to wash his face. Your mother was always polite to everyone. She always said that you never know if that person might have been some king or queen in a former life. But these are white demons, I protested. Father opened our trunk and got out some clean, well-ironed shirts, some of White Deer's masterpieces. You can take that up with your mother when she comes here herself. Until then, we'll do as she says. Understand? I said nothing because I was still annoyed, but I rubbed my face vigorously anyway. In fact, harder than mother used to do. I was not going to be accused of being unfaithful. When I changed into my clean shirt, father announced we were ready. And finally, we stepped outside. Standing there in that empty backyard, I was afraid. And I thought of the old ones. Perhaps they were watching. I had to try to act brave, at least. Father took my hand as if he knew I needed the support and we started toward the demon house. On the way, he pointed to the outhouse that sat at the end of the dirt lot. Then we went up the back steps and knocked at the door. Under my shirt, I wore the charm to keep demons away. I think that the demoness had been waiting for us because father had no sooner knocked once that she opened the door. She was the ver first demoness that I had ever seen this close up and I stared. I had expected her to be 10 feet tall with blue skin and to have a face covered with warts and earlobes that hung all the way down to her knees so that her earlobes would bounce off the knees when she walked. And she might have a pot belly shiny as a mirror and big sacks of flesh for breasts, and maybe she would only be wearing a loincloth. Instead, I saw a petite lady, not much bigger than Handclap. She had a large nose, but not absurdly so, and a red face and silver hair. And she wore a long dress of what looked like white cotton, over which she had put an, a, a red apron. The dress was freshly starched and crinkled when she moved and smelled good. She had a smile like the listener, she who hears prayers, who refused release from the cycle of lives until all her brothers and sisters too could be freed from them, from sin. Well, she said, well. I looked at her eyes and saw a friendly twinkle in them that made her seem even less threatening. There were demons after all who could be kindly disposed. 
I suddenly felt calm and unafraid as I stood before her. My father nudged me. I bowed carefully and presented our presents. It was a paper picture of the stove king who reported to the Lord of Heaven each year about what the family had done, both the good things and the bad things. It was customary each New Year's to bribe the little stove king. Some families offered him cookies and tea, which he could snack on during his journey to heaven. Others took a more direct approach and smeared his face with honey. Still others brought little paper horses and carts so he could ride up to heaven in style. After all these centuries of tender loving care from millions of Tang families, the stove king had quite, gotten quite pudgy. Father thought it might be nice to gesture to give the picture to the demoness, and I agreed, for the little stove king might take the demon's ignorance into account and give a good report for them. For the stove king was basically as kind and gentle a person as one was likely to find among the gods. The demoness turned it over and over in her hands in puzzlement until father spoke. He, Chinese saint of kitchen. I doubt if the demoness would have had a heathen god inside her kitchen, but a holy man was a different matter. Well, isn't that nice? She smiled pleasantly and stepped aside from the door. Please do come in. We sat down at a table covered with a cheery red checkered tablecloth in a cold abstract arrangement of squares, the kind of pattern the demons favored. And of course, all the smells in her kitchen were different. The demoness went to her icebox, a strange device, and took out a pitcher and poured a large glass of some white liquid for me. For herself and for father, she made tea using water from a copper cut tea kettle that she must have already boiled and set at the edge of the stove to keep hot. Then the demoness set down the biggest plate of things before me. They were brown colored and shaped like men and icing had been used to make eyes, nose and button coats. There, it sounded like gingerbread cookies, she said. I looked to father to explain the demonic word, which I did not know. Gingerbread, father said slowly. It's a kind of sweet ginger flavored cookie or cake. And what's that stuff? I looked dubiously at the glass of thick white liquid. Cow's milk. I almost made a face but caught myself. But that's cow's urine. No, no, stupid. Milk comes from the cow's udders. Now drink it. You must not offend the lady. I glanced at the demoness. She smiled at me. It was nice of her to think of me as a demon child, I guess. I sipped the liquid and managed not to make a face at the awful greasy taste. Go on and have a cookie, father ordered me sternly, and you better eat all of it. The milk did not make me inclined to trust the demoness's cookies much. They look like dung, I said. I don't care if it is dung. She made it, you eat it. I will if you will. Father sighed. He turned to the demoness. May I? Certainly, she said with a gracious smile. Father took one of the cookies and munched at it. Well, he didn't change into a toad or anything, and he didn't throw up. I had been expecting either possibility. I tried one of the cookies on the plate before me. The taste was heavenly. I gobbled up one up and started for another. Hey, Father snapped. First you don't want any, now you want to gobble them all up like a pig. Go on. The demoness pushed the plate closer to me. She smiled in real pleasure. I suddenly liked the way all the wrinkles in her face crinkled up in tiny smiles. I had another cookie. And then I was so thirsty that the, even the white stuff didn't taste so bad this time. Father and the demoness talked politely about the neighborhood, where was the best place to shop for what. The demoness seemed genuinely to want to help us, and I began to think that she was one of the good demons. I looked about her kitchen. Curiosity got the better of politeness. When I finally finished looking around her kitchen, I realized I had gone through four more of the cookies. Father noticed the almost empty plate at the same time. Look at this boy. He said in exasperation, he eats enough for four pigs. He started to apologize to the demoness, but she only smiled prettily again. There's only one real compliment for a cook, and that's for her guests to eat everything up. You must take the rest of the cookies with you. She smoothed her apron over her lap and winked at me secretly. You too kind, father spread his hand. You make us a shame. He kicked me, un he kicked me gently under the table. Yes, a shame, I piped up. At that moment, I heard a crash and the kitchen door swung open and there was a demon girl about my age lying on her stomach. She must have been listening at the door and lost her balance. It was only later that I realized her face was not always a bright red, but was only that way when she was angry or perhaps embarrassed. The demoness jumped up and slapped her hand on her forehead. Oh, that child, she 
she said. She'll be the death of me yet. You, Robin, I told you not to spy on our new guests. You said I wasn't to look, the demon girl said as she got up, dusting herself off. You didn't say anything about listening. Father hid a smile as the demon nest let out a sigh. <sighs> well, the harm has been done. Let me introduce you. She turned around with an apologetic smile. This is my niece, Robin. When my brother and his sister-in-law died, I took her in. Auntie calls me her burden, the demon girl added. I call you my treasure, too. The demoness slipped her arm around the demon girl and held her against her side. Though not very often, I'll admit. Father stood up and bowed. He poked me, and I slid off the chair and did the same. I did not mean to be rude when I stared at her, but she was the first demon child I had seen this close. For all I knew, demon children were not like me, but like dolls or toys that the demons took out of boxes for a while to decorate their sidewalks and then stormed away again inside their homes. The demon girl was like and unlike what I had imagined one of them to be. She seemed like a dwarf copy of her aunt, and her red face looked like a lantern that had been filled with blood and was going to burst at any moment. Her hair was the strangest color of golden red, as though her head had just burst into flame. She wore a short dress that I recognized as a gingham, and her knees and legs had many scratches and scars on them. And then I saw something in the demon girl's hand. It was a long rod with lenses at one end and a card with two pictures in it, held in a rack at the other. The demoness saw the direction in which I was looking. Show Moonshadow our stereopticon, Robin. The demon girl held the device up to her face so she, the lenses were against her eyes. You look at it like this, she said. Here, you try it. I put the viewer to my eyes and almost gasped, for it seemed as if I were suddenly in another world and no longer in the kitchen. Huge falls thundered right before me. That's Niagara Falls the demon girl said. Later, it was explained to me that each eye sees the same object from a slightly different angle, so that each eye has a slightly different picture. It's the brain that combines the two pictures together into one image and creates the stereoptical effect, the depth that the world seems to have for us. The stereopticon card has two pictures of the same object, but each picture is taken from a slightly different angle. Each of the viewer's eyes focuses on one of the pictures in the brain and trying to put them together. Gives the viewer the illusion of depth as if you were not looking at two pictures on a flat card, but rather as if you were looking at the real thing. Of course, at that moment, I didn't know all of this, so I was very impressed. Father looked through it for a long time. Dragon magic? I asked him. It's magic of the mind, if not of the dragons, Father said. He handed it back to the demon girl. But, uh, pleased and surprised. It, it's fun. He struggled for the right words and couldn't find them. Yes, Mr. Lee, the demoness said with a faint smile. We travel all the way around the world with it and yet never leave our parlor. We have more cards. Would you like to see them? Oh, yes, father said. She led us out of the kitchen into a hallway smelling of polish and old wood and then into a carpeted room with a bird inside a glass jar and books stacked neatly in a bookcase to one side. Later, I learned that most of them were travel books. The demoness and the demon girl would go to almost any lecturer who was giving a magic lantern show with slides of his travels. The demoness's father had never really had any time to take to her, any time to take her traveling, which was too bad since she left to travel. But as the demon girl fetched the box of viewing cards, I was looking at one corner of the room that was filled with a blend of strange colors. I looked up to see that it was the result of a window. Would you like to see our stained glass window? The demon asked, asked gently. I glanced at father and he nodded, so I walked over to it until I was about two yards away. You can take a closer look at that, the demoness said. It was a tall rectangular window. On the outside, there was a border of flowers and vines made from bits of colored glass set into a lead frame. But on the inner part of the window, there was a great green creature breathing yellow and red flames and biting at the spear that a silver-clad demon thrust into him. With a rustle of skirts, the demoness joined me. What's that? I asked, pointing at the green creature. A dragon, she said. You know. It's a very wicked animal that breathes fire and goes about eating up people and destroying towns. St. George killed many of them. 
I looked at father horrified, for these demons had turned the story of dragons upside down if they thought a holy man would kill them. But father answered for me. Very interesting. We have dragons too. Do you have a Chinese saint who did the same thing as St. George? The demoness asked with obvious satisfaction. You should tell them the truth about dragons, I told father. Maybe dragons in the demon lands are all evil as they believe, father shrugged. At any rate, when you're someone's guest, you don't correct her no matter how wrong she may be. The demoness had waited patiently during this exchange. Now she asked, what did he say? My boy, he asked if you make, father lied. Oh no, Papa had the window brought from England. She lovingly traced the curves of part of the lead frame. Papa said no home was complete without a stained glass window. And in my heart, I agreed with her for it was a lovely thing, even if the scene it depicted was all wrong. The demoness added, Papa also said that no one owned a stained glass window. It was meant to be shared, so you feel free to come look through it anytime you want, Moonshadow. You too kind. Fiddlesticks, Miss Whitlock said. In the meantime, Robin had sat down on a bench before a box-like contraption, taller than her and made of black wood. She lifted up a kind of lid about halfway down on its front, exposing thin white and black tiles of ivory. She began poking at the tiles aimlessly, producing strange musical sounds. What's that? I asked father. The demons call it an upright piano, father said. Miss Whitlaw must have recognized the last two words. Robin plays it very well. Oh, but you play it so much better, auntie, Robin said. Now, Robin, Miss Whitlaw said. I don't think they want to hear an old lady's antiquated repertoire. -y. Please, we not here before. Father poked me in the side. Yes, please, I chimed in. Robin left the bench as Miss Whitlow came over. She smoothed her long skirt underneath her and sat down with a little flounce like a young girl. She was smiling in a pleased but embarrassed manner. She turned to her niece. What should I play, Robin? Robin was standing beside the upright piano. Play simple gifts. Auntie. Miss Whitlaw inclined her head to one side. Well, all right. Her fingers moved over the tiles, drawing deep resonant sounds from within the big box, and she began to sing in a high, sweet voice. We didn't follow too many of the words then, but the demoness played it, and Robin sang it so often that I eventually got them. Tis the gift to be simple, tis the gift to be free. "'Tis the gift to come down where you ought to be, "'and we find ourselves in the place just right. "'Twill be in the valley of love and delight. "'When true simplicity is gained, "'to bow and to bend, we shan't be ashamed. "'To turn, turn, will be our delight, "'till by turning, turning, we come round right. "'And just then, the late sun must have shone "'on this side of the building, the dragon suddenly stood out in the luminous greens and yellows and reds, and I thought to myself, if there is light that comes from the magical pearl in the dragon's forehead, then it must be like the light of this window. The shafts of colored light shot across the room to where the demoness sat. Her skirt seemed to gather in a distorted picture of the dragon in the window, or not really distorted, but an image that was alive. The glass had been cast unevenly so that there were odd little flame-like curves in the corner colors. The image seemed to be so full of life, in fact, that it was bursting out of its outline. And I thought to myself, mother must be right. The kind of person who would own such a window must surely have been royalty in some other life. I found myself wishing more than ever that mother could be with me right then. I was sure she would agree with me. Later, as I got to know the demoness, I was to realize that despite her demonic appearance and dress and speech and customs, there was a gentle strength, a sweet, loving patience coupled with an iron hard core of what she thought was right and proper. I was always to think of her as the demoness who kept the dragon fire locked inside a window. After the song, the demoness spoke some more about dragons and I began to feel sorry for her. Her dragons were sly, spiteful creatures who stole people's gold and killed people for malicious fun. They sounded more and more like what mother and grandfather had told me about the outlaw dragons. It was a shame that the demoness had not gotten to know the true dragons of the sea, who were wise and benevolent. But father only smiled when I told him that, later when we were back in our stable. 
You know how the demons are, he said. They turn everything upside down and get everything the wrong way. As I helped father tug off his boots, I asked him something else that had been bothering me. Do you think the demoness is the ghost of a Tang woman? I mean, she could have forgotten a lot, even if she was a ghost. Father grunted as one boot came off. Maybe, maybe not. I began to work off his other boot. Or do you think the demoness might have been some Tang woman who did something so terrible in a former life that she was reborn here as a white demoness? When the boot came off in my hands, father massaged his feet. Maybe that too. I don't think she can be a ghost, I decided finally. I never heard of a ghost banished from the Middle Kingdom and made to forget so many things. But then she must have done something pretty bad if she was reborn over here as a demoness instead of back in the Middle Kingdom, at least as some kind of animal. Father tousled my hair. <laughs> you think too much. As I laid down on my mat and pulled the blanket up about my neck, it seemed to me that if this was the case, the demoness would surely be reborn as a rich Tang woman in her next life. I even toyed with the idea that perhaps we had been close to each other in some former life, a mother and child even. If that were so, I at least owed it to her to set her straight on dragons. It was with these thoughts that I fell asleep.